Want to make sure you're always updated when I post? Follow my Twitter at It's Karen Terry. No genre is without its issues or controversy, and historical romance is no different. Spare Room with Karen Terry. Hey y'all, and welcome to Spare Room. I'm Karen Terry, and today we're going to talk about historical romance. What makes something historical romance? And how can we, as role players, incorporate those tropes into our writing? That's what we're going to talk about today. A historical romance is a genre of fiction set sometime in the past, usually before the 1900s, and heavily features romance tropes. This seems pretty clear, but it gets complicated when you realize sometimes the word romance is simply a synonym for the word novel. For example, in French, a novel is called le roman, in Germany, du roman, and in Italian, il romanzo. Sorry for any pronunciation errors there. So this genre doesn't always feature what we in English-speaking countries would consider romance. For the purposes of this video, however, we're going to assume that most of us are role-playing and writing in primarily English-speaking spaces, because that's what the YouTube analytics tell me. So let's get into what historical romance means for English speakers. Walter Scott is usually seen as the inventor of the modern historical novel, primarily due to his series The Waverly Novels. He's cited as inspiration for tons of imitators and genre writers in the UK. The Waverly Novels are a series he wrote starting in 1814. They deal with various phases of Scottish history, and a major theme is the clash between the heroic traditions of the past and a practical vision for the future. So here we've got more capital R romance, less focus on a love story. Jane Porter, however, was writing historical romance long before Walter Scott even, and she was focusing on Scotland as well, and it was more capital R romance, less love story. And there were tons of others around this time writing these themes in the form of looking at the past. Some notable examples include Eleanor Hibbert, James Fenimore Copper, Philippa Carr, and Victoria Holt. But how did we move from the literary fiction over to the pining romance that we think of today when we think of historical romance? For that, we can thank Kathleen Woodawiz. She took the historical fiction genre and led it into the bedroom with her novel, The Flame and the Flower, published in 1972. This novel was mass marketed in paperback before it was ever published in hardcover, and it was a massive hit, selling over 2.3 million copies. Avon Publishing saw the success of this novel and went on to publish a whole bunch of other novels by different authors with the same formula. The titles were varying degrees of chaste to sexy, but this was the start of the bodice rippers that we know today. Some common elements of historical romance include strong female protagonist. She may not have a strong standing in her station in life, but she doesn't let that get her down. She knows what she wants, she doesn't take grief, and she won't let anyone control her. Well, unless it's really, really sexy, and then the love interest can have a little control as a treat. The bad boy. The romantic interest in these novels is often just a little bit rough around the edges. Maybe he's from that other, more violent tribe, or maybe he doesn't quite get how to treat others and the protagonist has to show him. Maybe he's destined to break her heart, but the protagonist just can't help herself. Basically, we have a Beauty and the Beast situation in a lot of these novels, but don't worry, the bad boy comes around in the end. Scandal. Strong female protagonists are always getting themselves into some scandal. Society ain't gonna tell her what to do. She wears what she wants, says what she wants, associates with who she likes, and well, the love interest just can't get enough of her carefree attitude. Despite the fact that they're breaking all the rules and must suffer the consequences for them, love wins out in the end. Compromising situations. The protagonist's reputation will be irrevocably damaged if she's caught hanging around this particular man. And yet, maybe it's because she's actually drawn to him, or maybe it's because of some misunderstanding. Either way, she's been caught, and now she's forced to marry him before they can even fall in love. She works for him. Maybe she's a governess watching his children. Okay, she's usually a governess watching his children. So that means they end up interacting regularly, and this is a historical romance novel, so the inevitable sparks fly. They bond over their mutual care for the children and end up in love at the end. Marriage of Convenience 
Maybe it's an arranged marriage that neither party wants into, or maybe it's a business deal that makes financial sense. But whatever the reason, there is no love there. At first. They thought they weren't going to have sex, but now they can't help themselves. Who will break first and tell the other what they've both been thinking? And as the couple gets to know each other, real true love blossoms. History, or lack thereof. What makes historical romance historical is that it takes place in the past relative to its time of publication. You'll find various levels of historical accuracy in these novels, and depending on what you're looking for, you may want to actually learn lots of history facts, or you maybe want more of an imagined past. There's the whole gamut to be found in historical romance. No genre is without its issues or controversy, and historical romance is no different. Any time we're delving into a past that we didn't actually live, we're having to pick and choose which elements to highlight, which elements to discard, and which elements we end up not finding in our research at all. So what effect does this have when we're writing a love story that is ultimately meant to evoke feelings of romance in the reader? It means that sometimes we gloss over the ugly bits of history and instead write an imagined past that's better than our current day and age. Or maybe we acknowledge that things weren't better, but through our writing we end up excusing it. Misogyny, racism, and other types of bigotry is just how it was back then. Throughout history, there have always been people who knew bigotry was wrong and fought against it. People didn't accept the systems they were given then any more than they do now. Now, is it harder to find historical information that backs that up? Of course it is, because history is written by the winners, and we do tend to not write about whoever lost in history, and therefore we don't hear about a lot of times that people were fighting against these systems. But if you dig into it, you'll find Every period of history had people that thought their current systems were just as abhorrent as we might think they are looking back at them today. Also, it's impossible to write about history without also writing about ourselves. For example, if you read books written by Victorians about ancient Rome, you'll learn a lot about Victorian England and the things that they valued and the things that they thought were important. And the same is true of historical romance that you're reading or writing today. So this video was for all of my historical romance fans out there, those that are super into those bodice rippers or who are still into Game of Thrones. I see you, I know why you're there, you are valid. So what do you think? Do you already use some of these themes in your writing? If not, does this inspire you to start trying it? Let me know all of that down below. And of course, as always, don't forget to make it a great day.